The House on the Cliff by Franklin W. Dixon A Hardy Boy Mystery, Book Two Chapter One, The Haunted House Three powerful motorcycles sped along the shore road that leads from the city of Bayport skirting Bearmont Bay on the Atlantic coast. It was a bright Saturday morning in June, and although the city sweltered in the heat, cool breezes blew in from the bay. Two of the motorcycles carried an extra passenger. All the cyclists were boys of about fifteen and sixteen years of age, and all five were students at Bayport High School. They were enjoying their Saturday holiday by this outing, glad of the chance to get away from the torrid warmth of the city for a few hours. When the foremost motorcycle reached a place where the shore road formed a junction with another highway leading to the north, the rider brought his machine to a stop and waited for the others to draw alongside. He was a tall, dark youth of sixteen with a clever, good-natured face. His name was Frank Hardy. "'Where do we go from here?' he called out to the others. The two remaining motorcycles— came to a stop, and the driver mopped their brow while the two other boys dismounted, glad of the chance to stretch their legs. One of the cyclists, a boy of fifteen, fair, with light curly hair, was Joe Hardy, a brother of Frank's, and the other lad was Chet Morton, a chum of the Hardy boys. The other youth was Geoffrey Gilroy and Biff Hooper, typical healthy American lads of high school age. "'You're the leader,' said Joe to his brother. "'We'll follow you. "'I'd rather have it settled. "'We started out without any particular place to go. "'There's not much fun just riding around the countryside. "'I don't much care where we go as long as we keep on going,' said Jerry. "'We get a breeze as long as we're traveling, "'but the minute we stop, I begin to sweat.' "'Chet Morton gazed along the shore road. "'I'll tell you what we can do,' he said suddenly. "'Let's go and visit the haunted house. "'Paluka's place? "'Sure. "'We've never been out there. "'I've passed it,' Frank said. "'But I didn't go very close to the place. "'I'll tell you.' "'Jerry Gilroy, who was a newcomer to Bayport, "'looked puzzled. "'Where is Paluka's place?' "'You can see it from here. "'Look,' said Chet taking him by the arm and bringing him over to the side of the road. See, where the shore road dips, away out near the end of the Bayermount Bay. Do you see that cliff? Yes, there's a stone house at the top. Well, that's Palooka's place. Who's Palooka? Who was Palooka, you mean? interjected Frank. He used to live there, but he was murdered. And that's why the place is supposed to be haunted. Reason enough, isn't it? asked Biff Hooper. I don't believe in ghosts, but I'll tell the whole world there are some funny stories going around about that house ever since Palooka was killed. He must have been a strange fellow anyway, com commented Jerry, to build a house in such a place as that. Indeed, the Palooka place had been built on an unusual site. High above the waters of the bay it stood, built close to the edge of a rocky and inhospitable cliff. It was some distance back from the road, and there was no other house within miles. The boys had traveled a little more than three miles since leaving Bayport, and the Palooka place was at least five miles away. It could hardly have been seen had it not been for its prominent position on the top of the cliff, silhouetted clearly against the sky. He was a strange fellow, Frank observed. No one knew very much about him. He didn't welcome visitors. In fact, he always kept a couple of vicious dogs around the place, so nobody cared to hang around there if they weren't invited. He was a miser, came Joe Hardy. He may have been. At least, that's what the theory is. Everybody said Palooka had a lot of money, but after his death there wasn't a nickel found in the house. Felix Palooka always said he wouldn't trust the banks. Put in Buff Hooper. But if he had any money, I don't know where he made it, for he didn't work at anything 
and he mighty seldom came into the city. Perhaps he inherited it, Jerry suggested. Maybe. He must have had money at some time to build that house. It's a great rambling stone place that must have cost thousands. Is anybody living there now? The others shook their heads. No one has lived there since the murder, and I don't think anyone ever will, said Frank Hardy. The house is too far out of the way, for one thing, and then the stories that have been going around. Well, I won't say I believe any place is haunted, but the Palooka place is certainly strange. There have been lights seen there at night, on stormy nights particularly, and once a motorist had a broken down, had a breakdown there, so he went up to the house for help. He didn't know anything about the history of the place. He got the scare of his life. What happened? He decided, when he went into the front yard, that the place was deserted, and he was just going to turn away when he saw an old man standing at one of the upper windows, looking at him. He called out, and the old man went away, and although the motorist hunted all through the house, he didn't find any trace of the old chap. So he left that place as quickly as he could. I, I don't blame him, remarked Jerry. But the house sounds interesting. I'm game to visit it. So am I, declared the others. Lead on, laughed Chet. It'll be a brave ghost that will tackle the whole five of us. Jerry clambered on behind Chet and Biff mounted Joe's motorcycle. The machines roared, and the little cavalcade started on its way down the shore road towards the house on the cliff. Instead of being an aimless trip, the outing had now assumed all the aspects of an adventure. With the exception of Jerry, the boys had all passed by the Palooka Place at one time or another. But none had ever ventured off the main road to explore the deserted place. The lane leading into Palooka grounds, never kept in good repair, even during the owner's lifetime, was now almost indiscernible, and was overgrown with weeds and bushes. The house itself was hidden from the roadway by trees. Most people gave the place a wide berth, whether they believed in ghosts or not, for the stories that had been told of the rambling stone building since the murder of Felix Palooka two years before were sufficient to indicate that there had been strange happenings in the old house. Whether or not they were of supernatural origin was a matter of debate. The murder of Felix Palooka had been particularly brutal, he was an old Italian suspected, as Frank said, of being a miser. He was very eccentric in his ways, and most people considered that he was not quite sound. But that as it may be, Bayport was shocked one morning to learn that the old man had been found dead in the kitchen of his house. His body riddled with bullets. The motivation apparently was robbery, for... Although it was popularly believed that the old man possessed a great deal of money that he kept with him in the house, it was never found, in spite of the most diligent search. This was the gloomy history of the place the Hardy Boys and their chums were now about to visit and explore, to add to the atmosphere of the excitement that had possessed them from the moment that the old house was mentioned. As they drew closer to the cliff, the sun retired behind a cloud, and the sky gradually became darker. Frank glanced up. Although the sky had been bright and clear when the party left Bayport, clouds had gathered in the east, and it was plain that a storm was gathering. Looks as if we'll have to go into Palooka Place, whether we want to or not, he called out to the others. It's going to rain. In a little while, they came to the lane that led to the haunted house. In spite of the fact that it was overgrown with weeds and bushes and the boys were able to drive down the faintly defined roadway until at last a rusty iron gate barred their progress. Frank, 
who was in the lead, got off his motorcycle and kicked the gate open, the rusty chains clanking as they fell through the staples. Then the party went on into the grounds. Under the lowering sky the that heralded the approaching storm, the grounds of the Palooka place were far from inviting. Dark, tall grass grew beneath the unkept trees, and thistles and weeds sprouted up in the very center of the roadway. A rising wind stirred among the branches and the trees, and the waving grasses rustled mournfully. "'Creepy sort of place,' muttered Jerry. "'Wait till you see the house,' Chet advised. Not one of them could restrain a slight shiver of apprehension when at last they came in view of the old stone building. It was framed in a mass of trees, bushes, and weeds that threatened to engulf it from all sides. Weeds obscured the front door. Bushes grew up level with the sills of the vacant downstairs windows. Trees on either side and beyond the house extended trailing branches down over the roof. A shutter hung by one hinge from an upstairs window and banged with every passing gust of wind. A death-like silence hung over the old building. Under the black clouds that now filled the entire sky, it was imbued with an atmosphere of gloom and terror. Come on, said Frank. Now that we're here, we may as well go in. "'Haven't seen any ghosts yet,' laughed Chet, with an effort of being light-hearted. But in spite of himself, his tone seemed forced. They left their motorcycles beneath a tree and advanced towards the old stone building. The front door was almost off its hinges, and it swung creakily open as Frank touched it. Frank stepped boldly into the hallway. The interior of the house was veiled in gloom, for the rear windows were boarded up, but the lads could see that everything was deep in dust. A staircase was before them, leading to the upper stories of the building. To the left was a closed door. This must be the parlor, said Frank, as he flung the door open. The room was empty. A stone fireplace was at one side, and as the boys came into the room, a rat scuttled out of the fireplace and raced across the floor, disappearing through a hole in the wall. The sound made everyone jump, for the boys' nerves were at tense on account of the forbidding atmosphere. "'Just a rat,' said Frank. His voice had the effect of calming the others. They stood hesitatingly in the middle of the deserted parlor. Joe went over to the window and looked out, but the view from the front window of the Palooka place was so lonely and gruesome in its aspect of tangled trees and weeds and undergrowth under the lowering darkness of the sky that he came back. "'Where shall we go next?' said Chet. "'Nothing much to see round here,' said Frank, disappointed. "'It's just an ordinary, dirty, old, deserted house.' Let's explore upstairs, anyway. At that moment there was a startling interruption. A weird shriek, quivering as if with terror, rang out from the upper part of the haunted house. Chapter 2 The Storm That shriek was the most fearful and uncanny sound the boys had ever heard. There was a diabolical malignance about it like the scream of some bloodthirsty animal, yet there was no mistaking the fact that it was uttered by a human being. As the quivering notes died away, the bare walls of the old house flung back the echoes so that the shriek seemed to be repeated again and again, but on a smaller scale. The boys stared at one another aghast. For a moment they were dumbfounded, then Jerry muttered, I'm getting out of here, and with that he started for the door. Me too, declared Biff Hooper, and Chet Morton followed him as he rushed for the doorway. What's the big idea? asked Frank, standing his ground. Let's stay and find out what this is all about. 
Joe, seeing that his brother remained there, made no move to follow the others, although it was plain that the weird shriek had unnerved him. "'You can stay,' flung back Jerry. "'I'm not. This place is haunted, and I don't mean maybe.' The three boys hastened through the doorway and out into the hall, and lost no time in regaining the front yard. Joe and Frank Hardy listened to their retreating footsteps. Frank shrugged his shoulders. "'I guess it gave them a pretty bad scare,' he said to his brother. "'We may as well go with them.' "'I guess so,' replied Joe, greatly relieved. They were alone in the gloomy and deserted old house, and as they stepped into the hallway, Joe cast a cautious glance up the stairway. But there was nothing to be seen. The upper floor was veiled with shadow. The house was in silence that seemed even heavier than before. When the two hardy boys got outside, they found the others waiting for them in the shelter of some trees, about a hundred yards from the house. The three were discussing the strange occurrence in excited tones, and when the hardy boys came up to them, Jerry said, "'I don't have to be convinced any further. The place is haunted for sure.' "'There's not much sense in running away from a sound,' remarked Frank lightly. "'If we had seen something, it might be different. I don't believe in ghosts, and I'd like to get to the bottom of this. It's foolish to run away. Let's go back.' Chet Morton and Biff Hooper looked a trifle ashamed of themselves because of their precipitous flight from the house while the Hardy Boys had remained. "'I got the scare of my life,' Chet confessed. "'Just the same.' I'm game to go back if you want to. How about you, Biff? Biff Hooper scratched his head reflectively. I'm none too anxious to go back in there again, he admitted. Not that I'm scared, of course, he added hastily. But I don't see where we'd learn anything anyway. Well, Joe and I are going back. That's settled, declared Frank. We want to get to the bottom of this mystery. Mysteries? are your meat, observed Biff. Well, when you come to think of it, this is a good chance for a little detective work. He alluded to the fact that the Hardy Boys were amateur detectives of some renown in Bayport. They came by their gift naturally, for their father, Fenton Hardy, had been for years on the detective staff of New York Police. Of late years, he had been living in Bayport, conducting a private detective service of his own with great success. He was known from one end of the country to the other as an exceptionally brilliant investigator. Frank and Joe Hardy, his sons, were ambitious to follow in their father's footsteps, although their mother wished them to prepare themselves for medicine and the law, respectively. But the lure of Fenton Hardy's calling was persistent, and the two boys were bent on proving to their parents that they were capable of becoming first-class detectives. They had given proof of this already by helping their father in a small way on a number of cases, but their first big success had been achieved when they solved the mystery of the jewel and bond robbery from the Tower Mansion in Bayport. The story of this had been related in the first and preceding volumes of this series. The Hardy Boys, The Tower Treasure, wherein was recounted how the Hardy Boys solved the mystery of the robbery when the Bayport police and even Fenton Hardy himself were baffled. I'd rather tackle a good mystery than eat, laughed Frank, and here's one right at hand. Let's go back. Biff Hooper did not care to seem guilty of cowardice by staying behind while his companions returned to the house, and he was on the point of a reluctant consent when the matter was suddenly solved for them all by a downpour of rain. Storm clouds had been gathering in the sky for the past hour, and there had been dun dull rumblings of thunder. Now an uneasy wind stirred the branches of the trees and rustled dismally among the undergrowth. There was a splatter of raindrops, and then the storm broke in an abrupt violence. 
"'The motorcycles!' cried Frank. Turning up their collars, the boys ran through the thick grass until they reached the place where the motorcycles had been parked. "'I saw an old shed near the house,' called out Joe. "'We can put the bikes under cover.' There was an abandoned wagon shed near the rear of the house, and towards this refuge the lads put their motorcycles. Although the shed was almost falling to pieces, the roof was still in fairly good condition, and the machines were safe from the downpour. "'Come on,' said Frank, when the motorcycles had been placed under cover. "'Let's go back into the house.' He led the way, running across the open space from the shed, through the driving rain, and Joe followed. The others, after a moment of hesitation, came after them. The back door of the house was open, and the lads ran up the steps into the shelter of the building. They were in a room that had evidently been used as a kitchen, and although the rain came in slanting streaks through the open windows, the glass of which had long since been shattered, they were at least sheltered from the downpour. The rain drummed on the roof of the house and poured from black skies on the nearby wagon shed. Thunder rolled the rumbling, threatening, and every once in a while a sheet of lightning tore a band of lurid light across the, the, across the gloom. Chet took off his cap, which was drenched, and tried to dry it out. The other stood by the window looking out at the terrific downpour. Then came the second shriek. It rang out suddenly, at a time when none of the lads was talking, and it was a replica of the first, a quivering, long-drawn-out yell that seemed to freeze the blood in their veins. No sooner had it died away than there came a terrible clap of thunder, and then the rain seemed to beat down on the roof of the old house in a frenzy. In the gloomy, dusty kitchen, the boys stared at one another. Frank broke the silence. I'm going to find out about this, he declared firmly, striding over to the door that led to the interior of the house. Me too, said Joe. Taking heart by the hardy boys' example, the others crowded at their heels. Frank flung open the door and strode into the room beyond. It was a very gloomy chamber for the one window was boarded up, but when their eyes became accustomed to the meager light, the boys saw that a door on the far side of the room led into a hallway. It was evidently not the hallway that they had already been in at the front of the house, but presumably one that led to a side door. "'Nothing here,' said Frank. "'I'd like to find those stairs.' That yell came from the upper part of the house." The boys made their way across the room. Outside they could hear the sweep of the rain and the steady rumbling of the thunder, for the storm was now at its height. Through the chinks of the boards over the window, they could occasionally see the lurid glare of lightning. Suddenly there was a blast of wind that seemed to shake the entire house. They wheeled about. The door behind them had been blown shut. Biff Hooper, who was nearest, grasped the knob and tried to open it. He wrenched and tugged at the door, but it remained an obstacle. "'We're locked in,' he muttered. "'We can get out all right,' said Frank. "'There must be a door in this side hall.' He walked across the room and entered the hallway. At the same instant, a maniacal howl rang through the old house. The howl echoed, magnified in volume." A flash of lightning illumined the startled faces of the five boys. With one accord, they rushed into the hallway. It was a narrow place, heavy with dust, and their feet thudded heavy on the moldy floor. Crash! At the far end of the hall, they had a glimpse of a falling plaster that fell in a great heap to the floor. A dense cloud of dust arose and filled the narrow chamber. Run for your lives! yelled Frank. But no sooner were the words out of his mouth than there came a ripping, crackling sound from overhead. Immediately above them, a large part of the ceiling, disturbed no doubt by the vibrations of their feet as they ran into the hall, and it had given way. A wide crackling that showed in the plaster quickly became wider, and then with a terrific roar, 
Half the ceiling fell tumbling down upon the lads. They were buried in the dust. Lace and plaster came upon them in such an avalanche that they were thrown to the floor. The splintering of the wood and the ominous cracking that followed indicated that more of the ceiling was about to go, and then came a roar even louder than the first, as another avalanche of debris rolled down upon them. Was the Palooka house falling in? Chapter 3 Empty Toolboxes When he was knocked off his feet by the impact of the falling debris, Frank Hardy crouched down, protecting his head as well as possible, until the downfall was over. Although a great deal of the rubbish descended, it was not heavy material, and when at last the rain of the plaster and splinters had ceased, Frank knew that he was uninjured, although he was almost buried in the heap and half-smothered by the thick dust that rose all about him. He managed to get to his feet, fighting his way clear to the rubbish, and the first sight that met his eyes was an arm sticking out of the debris nearby. He seized the outstretched hand and dragged the owner to safety, discovering that it was his brother Joe. By this time the others were beginning to extract themselves, and within a few minutes all five boys covered with dust from head to foot had scrambled out of the clear to the clear floor in the middle of the hall. No one was injured, although Joe and Jerry complained of bruises about the head and shoulders. "'Let's get out of here,' exclaimed Chet, as soon as he could get his breath. "'I'm not going to fool around this house any longer.' He looked about him for some means of escape. I don't think it's very healthy myself, Frank agreed. He saw a door at the side of the hall, and, going over, tried to open it. But the door was locked fast, and although he kicked at it and shoved against the panels with all his strength, he was unable to budge it. There's a window, declared Joe. Let's break our way out. The window was boarded over, but the glass was already shattered. So Chet and Jerry, picking up rocks that had tumbled down in the debris from the walls and ceilings, pounded at the boards. "'We'd better keep moving,' advised Biff Hooper. "'Perhaps the rest of the place will start caving in on us, too.' There was a splintering sound as one of the boards fell loose, revealing the rain-soaked trees and brushes outside, although onslaught with the rocks and another board fell away leaving a space sufficient to admit the passage of a human body. Gee, that looks good to me. Let's get out of here quick. That suits me fine. Don't lose any time. This whole building may be coming down soon. As the last words were uttered, the boys heard another crash behind them. It was so close that it made all of them jump. Hurry up, everybody, yelled Biff Hooper. "'Can't get out any too fast for me,' remarked Jerry. "'You said it,' muttered Chet. One by one, the boys scrambled up on the window sill and squeezed their way out between the boards, until at last all were standing outside the old house. The storm was still raging. Rain poured down in drenching torrents. "'Now let's get as far away from this place as we can travel,' said Jerry. "'Somebody's going to get killed if—' We stick round here any longer. He was pale with fright, and it was plain that the strange experience of the past hour had completely unnerved him. That's the way I feel about it, agreed Biff Hooper. I'm not a bit comfortable around here. Let's beat it. I'd like to find out what's wrong with the place, persisted Frank doggedly. You could drag me back in there with a team of horses, objected Chet. Let's clear out. I've had enough of it. Come on, urged Jerry. There's no use going back. The whole place will cave in on us if we aren't careful. And anyway, there's something fishy about the house. Frank saw that the others were determined on leaving, in spite of the pouring rain. So reluctantly he gave in, and the five boys hastened around the side of the house, over to the shed, where they had left the motorcycles. We can at least stay in the shed until the rain goes over, he said. 
"'Not on your life,' declared Chet Morton. "'I'm going to put so much distance between me and this haunted house as I can. "'That place gets on my nerves.' "'And with that, he began tinkering with his motorcycle, preparing to start it. "'Frank and Joe decided that no good would be served by arguing the matter, "'so they prepared to leave with the others, "'although they privately resolved to return to the Beluga place.' all the earliest at the earliest opportunity to investigate the mystery of the house on the cliff more thoroughly jerry and biff cooper took their places and in a few minutes the three motorcycles drove slowly out of the shed and across the yard towards the lane it was then that they heard the laugh from the haunted house came a harsh mocking laugh that rang out in peals of derisive merriment it contained for it continued for several seconds and could be heard plainly even above the noise of the engines and the drumming of the rain on the roof. Then it stopped abruptly. The boys looked at one another. Did you hear someone laugh? asked Frank, unable to believe his ears. You bet I did, exclaimed Chet, and that does settle it. I'm leaving here right away. "'That was the most nerve-wracking laugh I ever heard in my life,' declared Jerry. "'Let's get out of here quick.' "'Somebody's playing a joke on us,' Frank said angrily. "'I'm going back. Joke nothing. That place is haunted. Come on.' And with a roar, Chet's motorcycle leapt forward as he headed down the lane towards the main road. Joe, after looking behind and motoring to his brother to st and motioning to his brother to— stay with the party followed him soon the three motorcyclists were speeding down the lane and from the haunted house came peal after peal of the same demonical laughter though mocking their flight then as they rode on through the streaming rain and the haunted house was lost to sight among the wet and sodden trees the laughter died away when they reached the road round the boys turned their motorcycles in the direction of the bayport and more than five minutes the machine rocked and swerved as they sped along through the muddy ruts the boys were soaked to the skin and the water dripped from the peaks of their caps to their ears the rain poured down there and with redoubled vengeance the others could scarcely see chet's machine through the misty downpour Chet was making such good time back to Bayport that they found it difficult to keep up with him. Frank Hardy was still dissatisfied. He had really wanted to remain behind and probe the mystery of the house on the cliff further. He held no stock in the ghost theory. The shrieks and the mocking laugh, he was sure, were the human origin, but he could not prove it. It may have been that some boys had been in the house when they arrived and had simply seized the opportunity to play a joke on them. In that case, he muttered to himself, the story will be over. The Bayport High School by Monday and will be kitted within an inch of our lives for running away. Something told him, however, that this was no ordinary schoolboy prank. The incident of the fallen ceiling uh, that had unnerved him it was only by good luck that none of them had been seriously hurt of course it may have been entirely accidental but it seemed to have happened at a strangely opportune time then the recollection of the shrieks and the mocking laugh came back to him again and he shivered as he recalled the maniacal intensity of the tones if it was a fellow like ourselves he was a mighty good actor frank said to himself I've heard of a person's blood running cold, but I never knew that it meant until I heard those yells. Suddenly, his motorcycle began, as he termed it, acting up. It coughed, lurched, backfired explosively, and then the engine died. What a fine time for a breakdown, Frank said, as he dismounted. Joe drew up alongside. What's the matter, he called. Engine broke down. "'Gosh, aren't you lucky?' exclaimed Joe. "'There's a shed over at the side of the road. "'Bring it over under cover.' "'He pointed to a tumble-down shed nearby. "'Frank realized that 
it might take some time to discover the trouble. So he took the motorcycle over to the refuge his brother had indicated. In the meantime, Chet Morton had looked back to find that the others were not following him, and he decided to return. The roar of his machine could be heard through the rain as he rode back towards them. In the shelter of the shed, Frank first of all took off his coat and cap, which were dripping wet, and hung them up on a projecting board. Then, as Joe and Jerry stood by, glad of the chance to get in out of the rain, he rolled up his sleeves and prepared to find the source of the trouble. They could hear Chet calling to them as he drove along the road in the rain. Thanks, we're lost, laughed Joe. He went over to the front of the shed and hailed their companion. Come on up here, he shouted. Had a breakdown, grumbling audibly. Chet dismounted and came over towards the shed. In the meantime, Frank had opened the toolbox for his motorcycle. The others were startled by a sudden exclamation. Frank was staring at the toolbox with a bewildered expression on his face. My tools, he exclaimed. They're gone. The other boys crowded round. The toolbox was empty. Did you have them when you left Bayport? asked Joe. Of course I did. I never go anywhere without them. Who on earth could have taken them out? You can have mine, offered Joe, going over to his own motorcycle. He snapped open the toolbox on his machine and then gave a shout of astonishment. Mine are gone too. Mm -hmm.